and welcome again to Matt Reed's Books. It's been a long time since we did this, but we are back again. This time I'm taking a class on Theory of Justice by John Rawls, so might as well uh, finish up this entire book. Uh, so over the next month, I probably will actually complete this project, and we will have a full summary of Theory of Justice by John Rawls. So without further ado, we're going to continue the new format uh, whereby I basically just read uh, paragraphs and then summarize at my leisure. So here we go. 18, Rawls was going to discuss one of the principles for individuals. So we've already talked about uh, principles for structuring um, the basic foundations of institutions called the basic structure of society. But Rawls thinks that we also need principles for individuals. We also need principles for adjudicating between um, between societies, between nations, and we also need to create priority rules for determining how, when different principles conflict, how we adjudicate between uh, the different possibilities. He's not going to really take up the law of nations, uh, except very briefly in section 58, but he is going to take up a few of the principles for individuals in this and the upcoming section wants to go on to give us sort of a hierarchy for how we should go about in this particular academic program developing these different levels of obligations or these different um, principles. And he says basically that we need to do the basic structure of society principles first because lower principles like the principles of individual obligation and of nations um, and even the priority rules, of course, presuppose that fundamental structure of justice. And so it is sort of down the line. So in Rawls's schematic, the very um, top level issue is the, is the principle of practical reasoning. And below that, of course, are concepts of value, right, and moral worth. Under concept of right is the rest of the scheme. So first we have the social in systems and institutions, then second, we have individuals, which is parallel. And then third, we have the law of nations, which he doesn't discuss in depth here. Under the social systems and institutions, we have justice and efficiency. And under individuals, we have requirements and permissions. Um, under permissions, we have those indifferent and those supererogatory, etc. And under the requirements for individuals, we have obligations and natural duties. Under, under obligations, we have fairness and fidelity. Under natural duties, we have positive and negative. And under all of that, we have the priority rules. And that's both for institutional principles and for individual principles. And that scheme looks like this. And hopefully this is fair use. But all to say, the important part about this is we want to do this in order because of the different relationships of presupposition between the different kinds of principles. Then says um, some things about how mm, rightness and justice relate to the concept of fairness. And what he wants to say is that while we might have particular views of what the term right means, in, um, you know, from all sorts of different angles, from all sorts of different angles in ethical and moral theory. What he wants to say is when we think of right as under the broader notion of rightness as fairness, and we deliberate about it in reflective equilibrium, we are able to sort of explain the meaning of rightness. Uh, and this is to be an alternative to the other views of right uh, that we find in the tradition. And that this is basically the same way that we think about justice. So justice is fairness, rightness is fairness. Fairness is the master value for Rawls. So Rawls, in turn, wants to talk about the individual obligation of the principle of fairness and to distinguish these obligations from natural duties, which will be discussed in the next section. Under these obligations, um, we're talking about how it is that individuals can be bound to an institution. And you can be bound to an institution when you meet two conditions. First, the institution has to be just, that is, it has to um, meet the two conditions of a just institution, follow the two principles of justice. Um, and second, it has to be, uh, you have to have voluntarily accepted the benefits of the arrangement. 
So you can't benefit from the cooperative uh, venture of others without sort of putting in your fair share is, is the thought. And the, this means that Rawls concludes that you can't have an obligation to an autocratic government because the institution of the government is actually, um, you know, unfounded because it's unjust. These obligations from other kinds of moral requirements. One thing uh, you might think is that you have to have some kind of promise or agreement. But what's interesting is, as long as you um, accept benefits, uh, Rawls basically thinks you're sort of implicated in the cooperative game. So you have to sort of play by the rules when you accept the benefits. Um, now, whether, of course, this can be folded into a notion of promise and agreement um, by reliance on the background rules, which is another feature of the institution, uh, I think that, that that's up for debate. Um, but yes, there's also the background rules under which the agreement is occurring. And I would say that that should also include probably the language. Uh, and the language is grammar that has sort of implied tracks for rules, meta rules maybe. Um, and finally, the obligations are owed to definite individuals, the ones who are cooperating to maintain the agreement. So um, in this case, it is... It seems like Rawls is saying that uh, the rules are internally focused, um, which is interesting. I, I wonder if how he thinks about um, you know, charity organizations that are uh, externally focused. There's a few interesting statements. One, noting that he's not sure that citizens really have political obligations per se. They have this general obligation to cooperate in the structures of justice and to just political order but they don't have special political obligations in the same way that those who hold public office have special political obligations. He also notes on the question of promises that that will require, you know, looking at promises more broadly, that will require a much deeper investigation, and he plans on doing that in sections 51 and 52. So in this section, section 19, he wants to turn very briefly from the question of obligations to or from the right from the question of obligations to the questions of um, duties, uh, positive and negative duties, and he doesn't want to put them all together under a single principle of duty. His main point is simply that uh, both positive and negative duties have something intuitive about the distinction, but in the end, it's uh, not that important. And except perhaps to say that negative duties might outrank positive ones on occasion, but he's mostly not going to uh, pursue that line of reasoning. Marks off natural duties from the other obligations that Rawls has already discussed is the part where they're natural. That is, that they don't stem from some uh, contractual commitment or obligation that we've taken on uh, in a particular move. So they already exist regardless of whether we contract them. And this is, uh, this is, for example, we have duty not to be cruel, we have a duty to help other people, um, we have a duty to not kill people in general. Um, whether or not we're in some kind of institutional relationship with these people. And he says that uh, this is mostly especially necessary for establishing international law. The law of nations uh, is to basically <laughs> determine that the uh, states conducting wars uh, and, well, the states interacting with one another respect these natural duties. He also wants to stress that even though we use contractualism to originate our understanding of a theory of justice, that doesn't mean that contract, it, that doesn't mean that justice is something that we only um, have, that only obtains when we enter into intentional agreement. Remember, the contractualist method is just a hypothetical contract. The original position is a thought experiment that helps us attune ourselves to the right principles of justice and the way that we would understand how to develop principles of justice. But justice itself is a natural duty. We have to be just towards one another, whether or not we're in some kind of institutional relationship or whether or not we've made promises to one another. 
So Rawls wants to put a significant distance between this sort of methodological tool that he's using and the idea that somehow this means that distinct acts of contracting are what uh, ends up constituting justice. As far as he's concerned, once we've sort of established the full uh, battery of rights and full, the full content of justice, we can just do away with the uh, thought experiment that led to its uh, creation, and we don't have to take up anything more from that as far as like the, the fundamental nature of being contractual or something. Okay, well, isn't that kind of contradictory <laughs> um, that we would have these unconditional principles that are actually like the result of this totally conditional process of uh, talking to one another in the original position and deliberating? But Rawls just says, well, as long as the parties in the original position would agree to hold the duties as unconditional, um, it's not contradictory because we are setting up the uh, sort of universe of obligations. And if we remember that it's a thought experiment, um, we don't have sort of this recursion problem of, well, you know, how do we, how do we really have them um, be universal? Uh, well, they aren't universal in a sort of prior, prior to the original position discussion sense, um, but they are universal uh, in fact because that original position discussion sense is just a heuristic for understanding what a rational conception of justice would be. You say that there's both a universal obligation of justice that binds us to political institutions. That is, we have to cooperate with just political institutions, and that's part of justice, and that's universal. But there's also um, additional ways that you can be bound to the state or bound to political institutions, and one of those is uh, by the principle of justice as fairness. Um, that is, that if you hold a special power, that is, if you hold public office, you are especially bound to the political institutions because you are deriving benefit from your position in the political institutions. Um, and so this, I think, is probably going to end up being sort of the basis for progressive taxation for Rawls, uh, in addition to a few other things. He concludes the section by noting that even though he's not going to really discuss the place of supererogatory acts, that is, acts that go above and beyond what's morally required, um, he wants to say that he's not ignoring it. Uh, he's just bracketing it on purpose because there's not enough time to cover this. Um, but in his own scheme, he does not have the utilitarian view um, that there's no such thing as supererogatory acts, that basically people can be obligated into them. Um, but instead, he says that there could be a class of supererogatory acts. What the obligation is is to... Um, you know, to require doing the improve, improving the, the goodness equilibrium if it's of you know, minimal cost to yourself. But if it's of significant individual cost, uh, Rawls doesn't think that there's uh, any significant pull to the idea that you still are uh, obligated just equally. Includes Matt Reed's books for another episode. Now, I'm going to actually keep going, believe it or not, and... Uh, we're going to keep going for quite quite a bit more. I mean, really, I have another 67 pages that I have to complete before Wednesday, so we've got lots more of this to go. Uh, but the good news is I'm going to give everyone a break, and um, I'm going to come back and probably do the next four chapters, um, and then I'm going to probably take a break for the day, and that'll leave us with just, I don't know, 40 more pages in this, and we'll have finished the first uh, the first section, I believe. Um, let's see here. Yeah, we'll, we'll have finished the first part. So we'll be on page 167 of the revised edition, and that's only out of, I don't know, 514 pages. Uh, so we're, we'll be on our way in that sense. Anyway, see you all next time.